going to start a little. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Today, uh, we have Prof. Manis Kalko this morning giving the second session on open quantum systems. Um, you know, so we had uh, Prof. Massimo Palma on Monday, uh, who gave the initial session on uh, open quantum systems. Um, later today, we have uh, Dr. Yelena Gurianova from ICOCI, who will be giving the second session on quantum thermodynamics. And then uh, this evening, we have two joint track sessions, one by uh, Dr. Mark Jackson from Continuum, who will tell us sort of about their long-term vision. And then we have this 90-minute uh, session on quantum machine learning by uh, Dr. Zoe Holmes, uh, who was doing the uh, basics track earlier. Great. So I'll leave you in the good hands of Prof. Maniscalco. And uh, the coffee break has been moved to 10.30. <laughs> and uh, yeah, enjoy. Hi. Uh, hi, uh, I already said hi before, but this now doesn't work anymore. Uh, I tried to move it. The, the clicker doesn't work. Never mind. I mean, uh, it's OK, because this technology sometimes creates. Maybe I, I, I do this. Let's see if I. Uh, no, it does not. No. Well, OK, you know what? Uh, I will use my <laughs> finger <laughs> to, <laughs> to do this. And it does not work even that. <laughs> so magic doesn't work absolutely anything. So I have to ask stop sharing or something like that. OK, let's start again. You, this, as go away. Now, share. Uh, Maybe I do this now. I take this and I play, and there you go. Ah, wow, wonderful. Okay, yes. So um, this is not a course; it's a lecture. Uh, but I would like to uh, divide it into parts. So the first hour will be about some, so to say, advanced concepts of open quantum system theory. I don't know how advanced they are. Uh, it's, uh, I will start with the general formalism, the general framework. And then I will describe uh, something that has to do with master equations, microscopic derivation of master equations, Markovianity and non-Markovianity. And at some point uh, when I will be, uh, when, when you will be, uh, you know, satisfied or I will be tired of talking about that, I will switch to the second part, which instead is more uh, exciting because this is more related to recent results. Uh, in fact, it's something which has to do with the near-term quantum devices. I've seen from the program that you have already worked, um, you, know, you have already um, studied uh, in other lectures uh, some algorithms, both for near-term uh, quantum computers like VQE and also for um, fault-tolerant quantum computers like Shore and so on. And so I want to give you some example of when we need actually to take into account errors uh, for, uh, um, for uh, uh, and therefore uh, error coming from the interaction with the environment. So it's more like an application. The second part is more uh, research oriented. The first part is more setting the ground. And generally, I, I know that there is most likely a lot of material to go through, um, but uh, I'm assuming that there is already a certain knowledge, basic knowledge of open quantum systems, but you can stop me anytime uh, to, to, you know, to ask questions. And there is also another thing, I, I'm also assuming that, I mean, I won't go through all the detailed calculations because I, what I decided instead is to present many concepts uh, and the detailed calculations, is, uh, it's, it's only two hours after all, actually one and a half probably, uh, and the detailed calculations instead is something that if you want you can do as an exercise um, your, on your own, okay? So it's a different spirit with respect to going through all the details, it's instead going through the concepts and you, you, you can go in depth um, on your own. Okay, so the first part will be uh, introduction, uh, preliminaries, definitions, what are dynamical maps, then I will introduce Markovian semigroup and non-Markovian dynamics, and the second part will be about a way of measuring in near-term quantum devices, uh, which is different. It uses so-called informationally complete uh, measurements, or POVMs. I will define what they are, so as generalized measurements, and I will describe how noise affects them and I, uh, how we can prevent this to happen. So what we can do when, you need to when we need to handle noise in real devices. 
Um, so how many of you have done, other than the previous lecture with Professor Palma, um, studies on open quantum systems? Can you raise your hand? You, you are, you're used to work with open quantum systems. Many, okay. So this means that many of these definitions will be very familiar to you, but let me give them just so that we have a common ground. Hmm? So the first take-home message is that I like take-home messages, and therefore I will give you take-home messages all through uh, the first part. The second part, perhaps two, I don't know, let's see. I mean, there are, but they are hidden, in the sense that there is no slide saying that this is a take-home message. Now, open quantum systems theory is a very general framework. It has been used in many different fields of physics. There's a long tradition, for example, in chemistry of handling open quantum system theory. And very often there is a, 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 an issue related to notation and understanding. I mean, people have, different, have called Markovian or non-Markovian for ages different things. So very often there is confusion which comes from these terms exactly because it is so general. And there have been a number of um, you know, improvements or, or, or you know, new direction that have, have come from the really cross-fertilization from quantum information theory uh, and many concepts using quantum information theory uh, and um, the more theoretical, I would say, maybe quantum optics uh, and open quantum system uh, field. So there has been these exchanges. Um, but uh, I give you some references that I've been always found useful where to study open quantum system. The first one is a book uh, from um, Heinz Peter Bory and Francesco Petruccione, which is the theory of open quantum systems. And there are a number of reviews. None of them are very recent, but I think they are quite good uh, just to grasp the, the main concepts, uh, specifically uh, in many cases mm, this related to distinctions between Markovianity and non-Markovianity. So this is just in case you want to um, go in depth in many of these concepts. And of course, I will be very superficial going through all of these things. So when we talk about quantum systems, what we talk about generally are quantum systems interacting with environments. And this is how quantum system, what quantum systems do. They do interact with environments. Traditionally and experimentally, there has been a large uh, effort to, to try to isolate them as much as possible from mm, the external environment. And this has led to experimental realizations that are now the basis of all our quantum technologies. Just because experiments have born in a direction in which we can isolate them as much as possible and therefore keep the coherence for as long as possible. But naturally, they do interact with their environment. And the first thing that one, when one starts studying open quantum system, the first thing that one has to do is to be very clear in what you define as the system. Okay, so to have a model or a Hamiltonian that you define as the system and all the rest is the environment. And this seems trivial, but it happens often that if you change the border between what you de defi define as the system and what you define as the environment, a lot of things can change. For example, the definition of Markovian versus non-Markovian can change depending on whether your, your system contains a certain degree of freedom of the environment or not. So the very first thing is be very clear about what is, what is your, your system. And then there are a number of examples of environments that are very diverse. Very often I will, I will use, I, I, in my tradition, let's say in my school, I've been using as standard models of environment, infinite chains of harmonic oscillators or uh, spin chains, but of course already this tells you a distinction, environments which are bosonic versus environments which are spin-like or, or fermionic environments. And, and, um, and then there are the wi wide class of environments which are absolutely classical. So it's like stochastic fluctuation in some of your parameters. All of these things can be described in the fr framework of open quantum systems. Now, generally, if we think in terms of a quantum system interacting with a quantum environment, in the majority of the textbooks that you will find, there is a an sometimes untold assumption, okay? And this assumption is that you assume that the total, the, the, the state of the total system, meaning system and environment, um, initially in what you call the time zero, it could be the time in which your experiment starts, you know, uh, initial time, uh, is a product state of the system state and the environment state. Now this assumption is at the basis of even the derivation of any master equation, okay? So even if people don't, don't know it or, or we forget about it, this is an assumption which is at the basis of everything of op in open quantum system. I mean, almost everything. There have been a number of results that go, you know, that take into account initial correlations. But for everything I will be saying, and for everything that we will find, for example, in Breuer and Petruccione's book, you know, that is one of the main textbooks 
This is the main leading assumption. Generally, however, as time evolves, system and environment gets correlated. They could be classical correlations or quantum correlations. And in general, what we are interested in uh, is, uh, this doesn't work for me. I mean, it's me. I mean, it's me. It's just that I cannot point. I've been always bad at pointing. Anyway, um, the, 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 the state, the total state of the system, by definition, is the trace over the degrees of freedom of the environment uh, of the state um, of, of the total state. So the system state is the trace over the degrees of partial trace over the degrees of uh, freedom of the environment of the total system. In this case, um, of course, in principle, there can be a time t, uh, a time t correlations. Okay, just standard notation. In general, uh, we, we, we can also have frameworks in which we don't have actually a quantum state, as I said before, but we can also have just classical noise, random noise. Now, the second take on message, therefore, is remember always, sometimes it's not said, but this assumption is at the basis of 99% of open quantum system theory formalism. Now, what is the goal of open quantum system theory? Well, I would say that the main goal of open quantum system theory is to predict the dynamics of an open system. So this means to predict, given a certain initial state that you, in general, prepare if you, if you, are, if you have a quantum computer or a quantum device, you initialize it, to study how it evolves in time. And this is done by these two, uh, what I call the queen and the king uh, of open quantum system theory, that are the dynamical map and the master equation. So these two things are, are very important. They are both used to describe dynamics and they are obviously related, okay? Now, when and where can we use open quantum system theory? Here I will be super f fast because you know it already, okay? But maybe it's a little bit of, tradi of, of historic uh, background. So, uh, first of all, in foundations, open quantum system theory has been extensively used to describe the transition between quantum and classical. Okay, so the, the quantum to classical crossover is defined in terms of, open, of the open quantum system theory. Okay, this is a very old uh, drawing uh, of, uh, uh, you know, the, the transition between quantum and classical, Zurek, um, old uh, physics today, um, in which he introduces environment induced decohering. Now, another, yes, you can do it. And related to that, fantastic experiments uh, by Serge Roche and, and the collaborators uh, showing uh, that, that creation, generation of a mesoscopic Schrodinger cut state, which is uh, uh, here represented in terms of the Wigner function, and how the quantum coherence, uh, which is represented by these, by these uh, interference fringes here, gradually is lost. All this can be described in terms of open quantum system theory. So you can really study the dynamics at the level really of foundations. But then of course, nowadays we are, uh, we are um, in the era of quantum technologies and we all know that all quantum technologies are affected by noise and this noise is limiting them in, in ways that you know, we, we try to uh, or we want to um, uh, overcome. And again, all this can be cast in the framework of open quantum system theory. And I have this slide just because I like these apples that are becoming larger and larger. So there is nothing else than at this point we will all observe the apples here, no? The meaning of this slide <laughs> here, other than uh, the apples uh, are a nice effect, um, the meaning of nice here is simply to tell you that different physical implementations, different physical systems, and here there are many, and many of you will recognize platforms for, for quantum computing, they suffer different types of noise. So the modelization, the type of noise is different, in some cases is, um, you know, has correlations in time, or in other cases it doesn't, but it has to be modeled differently. So depending on the physical system, you, you want to adapt your general model, to describe uh, uh, the specific platform and what are, from the experiments really, the type of noise that are, uh, you know, more, more dominant in that case. Now, the plan uh, we will follow here, we will recall briefly, is just notation, states, transformations, what is the dynamical map and the master equation. So let's begin just, oh, just with the, uh, again, definitions which are simply, um, you know, things that you already know, but so that we know the, the, all the notation. Now, in general, I will focus just on quantum systems that live in a finite dimensional uh, Hilbert space. We will not do continuous systems. And we introduce the density operator, 
which is uh, the convex combination uh, of psi k, psi k, where w k is our probability distribution. They are positive and trace one. As you know, the co this decomposition is highly non-unique, uh, and however, this, is, this defines the state of an open quantum system uh, in, uh, in present, so in the state of a quantum system in presence of noise. Generally, they are not pure state, so it's not sufficient to have a state vector, but you have to have this object here. And if we think in terms of transformations, because you know, the dynamics of a, of a quantum system in presence of noise, the dynamics of rho, is described by a transformation, by a map. Uh, and here I will indicate with M and C the space of matrices, uh, n, n by n matrices, in living in, in, in the um, complex, uh, C is the complex, complex, how do you say, complex space, yes, exactly. Uh, and um, in particular, we will consider a subset of this space, the subset of positive matrices. Uh, and I will focus on this, uh, I will introduce this, these properties that are important. Uh, the maps uh, defined in this way, uh, um, maps that are hermeticity preserving, that are positive, that are trace preserving, and in some cases we will consider, uh, consider also unitality, okay? So these maps describe transformations of states, and, and there are a number of properties that are useful uh, to, and, and we will say they have to be in practice um, uh, introduced. Why? Because for example, wh why, why a positivity? Uh, why the, mm, the maps have to be positive? Because we know that the, uh, the, in the state is described by the positive operators, and if we map it to another state, the map, the image has to be positive, right? So you want to have a map which preserves positivity. It has to preserve the trace for the probabilistic interpretation of the state to remain the same, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, unitality obviously is not a requirement. I mean, you can have maps, absolutely physical maps, which are non-unital, but there are many, uh, many examples of maps which are uh, unital. Okay, <coughs> so now if we think in terms of dynamics, we can describe dynamics in terms of these maps, right? We have an initial state at time zero and a state at time T1, which is obtained by applying this, this linear map. Hmm? Now, is that enough? So is that enough? The question of is that enough is, are these properties sufficient you know, to have a physical state, meaning that to have a rho s of t1, okay, this is a fixed time, okay, uh, to be a physical state given that phi is a linear map which satisfies all these properties. Is this enough? No, yeah, ooh, okay, thanks. I like, no, it's nice that uh, someone talks, I wonder, because in Finland, nobody would have replied. At this point, it would have been a long silence, lasting forever, and, but I, 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 I really like Finnish people, it's just that they don't talk much. But the answer is no, this is correct. And in order to understand why this is not enough, we need to consider entangled systems. So we need to consider not just one, for example, qubit uh, of a given dimension, but, for, but two. So we define uh, now two systems, H1 and H2. We consider a composite map, which is the tensor product of the two maps. Uh, and um, the, the two uh, Hilbert spaces can have different dimension, okay, N and M in this case. Uh, and then you can, uh, you can uh, look at specifically uh, this type of composite maps acting. Now, just to confuse you a little bit, just because otherwise it's to, you know, to make sure that you are following here, I call the state A. Before I called it rho, but A is the state, okay? To make sure that everyone is following, otherwise it's too easy, rho, always rho, <laughs> it's obvious, no? Now it's A. Now, I, I act uh, with, this, uh, with this composite map on the state A, and in particular, I, I, mean, I can write it in this form, never mind, this is, this is trivial. This uh, Eij is, is, is the basis uh, in, uh, uh, of the uh, previous system, okay? Uh, the Hamiltonian one, okay? And what happens here is that now, let's assume that this phi, this little phi, this map here acting on the second qubit, is the transposition, right? So now I have identity on one, uh, in particular here I have identity two, so I assume uh, dimension two, right? And this thing here is transposition, I will also consider two, okay? So I transpose, I use the transposition on one of the qubits and nothing happens on the other, and I also assume that there is a maximally entangled state. Okay, so I make this, this specific assumption. Now, in this case, what happens is something annoying. 
very annoying. Okay, this is an example. Remember, identity obviously is positive, is a positive map, the identity. And also five, the transposition is positive as well. So you are composing two, two positive maps, right? So, and you would assume that this is innocuous thing. And, 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 and it turns out that it is not, okay? It is not, sorry, uh, this I went, I went uh, uh, too, too, too fast. The problem in this case is that what can happen is that the result of the application of this state of this map to the state is a violation of positivity. So th the resulting state can become negative. And this is obviously a problem, which means simply that I have to have a stronger requirement. And this stronger requirement is called complete positivity, okay? So summarizing all this blah, blah, blah that I just said means the following thing. If I have a map that describes the dynamic of the system and I want this map to be physical, meaning to map a physical state into another physical state, it is not sufficient to require that the map, the linear map, is uh, positive, trace preserving, uh, and, uh, and so on. I also have to add another requirement that is complete positivity, okay? Complete positivity is a stronger requirement, obviously, than positivity, and I introduce it here. So generally maps are, are called K-positive whenever they are, um, the composition of the map with the identity in k-dimensional space is positive. So this is k-positivity. So it's positive in the extension, you know, uh, an enlargement of an Hilbert space so defined. Uh, and complete positivity is the condition in which this is true, so the map is k-positive for all k's, for any k. Okay? Yes? Are we happy? Can we continue? Let's continue. Thanks. I like it. Another yes. Oh, right. Okay. Now, uh, this is what the quantum information theory are called quantum channels. So, the, the whole point of before is that why do we need to require uh, complete positivity? Because of entanglement in the end. Okay. So, the problem is, is, is entanglement, like, sort of enforces us uh, to uh, to make a further assumption, which is complete positivity. Now, these maps here. Uh, uh, so completely positive and trace preserving map in quantum information theory are called quantum channels and they are generally extensively uh, used to describe uh, everything uh, but also to describe uh, um, to describe open quantum systems um, I, there is a, a tiny little difference that i will say in a moment i mean it's not a difference but i will point it out soon now there is a theorem which is another, if you want, uh, characterization of completely positive and trace preserving map, which is a choice theorem. This is fantastic if you think about it. It's really, really, really a very, very cool theorem. And it says that another characterization of complete positivity uh, is the fact that if I now look, look, this n here is not k. K round, uh, was, was an index that went from 1 to 2, 3, 4, 5, until you can count all. This n instead is the dimensionality of your, of your, uh, of, of your um, qubit space or, or system space, okay? So you have a, a system which, li which phi is applied to, which has a certain dimensionality, and then uh, now you com consider this specific combination, this identity of, let's say that this is a qubit and here this would be dimension two, okay? And you have a specific state, which is this uh, maximally entangled state here, okay? Now, this, characterizes completely complete positivity. So instead of using the, using the previous uh, uh, definition, this is a bit unpractical because you would need to assume positivity for all case. Uh, here you have two super nice things. The first one is that you, you can only look at a finite dimension. Uh, in this case, you just to have to extend the, uh, the dimension of the qubit with another qubit. And then you don't have to prove it for all the states, but you, it's sufficient that you apply it to just one state, which is the maximally entangled state. And if this is verified, you are happy. This is a nice, uh, this is a practical way in which people um, with finite dimensional systems, small finite dimensional system, check that the complete positivity is not violated. Okay. Now, another characterization is the Krauss form, um, but again, you use it very much in quantum information theory. I will not describe it in detail, but probably if you have mm, done previous lectures, I'm sure you have touched also. This is the usual definition of, uh, of complete positivity. So, very briefly, transformations between states uh, are 
described in terms of quantum channels, which are completely positive and trace preserving map. And an extension, if you want, uh, of this transformation is, is families of completely positive and trace preserving map. And this is what we will define as dynamical maps. Okay? So we, we review, we uh, define the state, we define the transformation, uh, and now I ask you if you have questions on this part. But I think this is just standard notation you know, that I assume everyone is familiar, and I'm just uh, re recalling it simply because we, we are using, I will be using it, okay? Nice. Now, dynamical maps are a family of completely positive and trace preserving maps parameterized by time. So a dynamical map is not one map, but it's a family of maps, okay? But they have the mm, properties of, of, of course, of, of quantum channels. They are family of quantum channels. And in particular, of, of course, with the condition, I will often use lambda t until, unless I want to confuse you, uh, the, and, but I will tell you if I'm using changing notation, uh, with the condition that, that the initial time t equals zero, this is the identity. Okay. This is definition of dynamical map. And they describe the transformation of the state at all times. Okay. Now, question. What happens if this assumption number one is violated? Let's assume that this is not true, okay? What happens or what can happen to the dynamics? Why this clicker? Okay, you, you have two possibilities. The dynamical map need not be completely positive. In fact, it cannot be, it can even not be positive. And the second thing, the dynamical map still needs to be completely positive. So assume that you have an initial correlation. And you want to describe the dynamics in presence of initial correlations. Do I still need to assume that the map is, com is completely positive, the dynamical map, so to describe the dynamics? In general, it will not be. So the answer is that in general, if I have initial correlations, I have to give up the requirement uh, of a description in terms of transformation that requires complete positivity. So I, I have to go beyond complete positivity in the description uh, of, the, um, uh, of the system. In general, this will not, will not be, so it, that's why many of the formalism, uh, formalisms that uh, de try to describe uh, uh, open quantum system with initial, cor with initial correlations, they have to use more general type of maps than uh, completely positive and trace preserving map. So you have to, I it is possible, but you have to, and in a way it is a little bit annoying because completely positive and trace preserving map has a lot of nice properties that you would like to use. But you have to go a little bit beyond this framework if you want to use, uh, or if you want to characterize the systems in which there are initial correlations. Okay, now, we describe the transformations, how about the equation of motion? So another way of looking at dynamics uh, is uh, to, to look at the equation of motion, really, like in a way like Newton's equation, or like Schrodinger equation, really equation of motion uh, for your uh, reduced state rho s. Okay, this is, uh, it takes the name of master equation. Okay, so the master equation tells, you know, describes the dynamics in terms of an equation of motion. And I uh, call this LT the dissipator. In general, it's a super operator. It has many names. Some people call it the dissipator or Limbladian when it is uh, Limblad. Or, mm, there are many ways of calling it. But in general, it's a super operator which acts on the operator rho s uh, and, and describe the form uh, of the equation of motion. Examples are this, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, is the, this is a simple example in which you have a two-level atom subjected to spontaneous emission. Uh, and this means, uh, basically, that if I identify, I call here sigma minus and sigma pa plus uh, the inversion operators. So sigma minus describe transition from the excited state to the ground state, and sigma plus is the other one, the opposite. So uh, the, the, the master equation very well known in quantum optics for spontaneous emission is, is, uh, has this form. So here you have this rho dot is this uh, do, the d rho and dt, so it's the same as this side. And on this other side, you have all these you know, combination of, uh, this is the commutator between the uh, system um, Hamiltonian uh, and, uh, and Rho, and then you have this, this part which describes dissipation. This is just to give you an example on in something that you might have, have been studied in, in the past uh, of, um, you know, how they look like. Change, yes. 
What is the connection between the master equation and the dynamical map? Well, the connection is, is uh, the following. So remember, this is how I defined the dynamical map. Now, if I just plug in rho s here, I have an equation for analogous equation from the master equation for the, um, for the dynamical map, which has this form, with the initial condition lambda not equal the identity. And the solution is immediate, right? The solution of this equation is just the, can be written as the t is the chronological ordering operator of the exponential of the integral between 0 and t of uh, lambda tau d tau. Okay, so this is, for a for this is just a formal solution. It is the solution of, uh, of, the, of the equation uh, for, the, um, for the dynamical map which corresponds to the, to the master equation. So the connection between the dynamical map and this object here, that is the, uh, the Liouvillian or Lindladian, however you want to call it, uh, the connection is the following. So in other terms, L of tau or L of t is the generator of the dynamics. Okay. So in general, you have, you have this, uh, this connection between the two. And in a way, solving the master equation in operatorial form corresponds to finding the dynamical map. Okay. This is uh, finding the solution for all states. OK. Well, this is just a reminder that generally the way in which you, you uh, write this, how, how do you interpret this object here? These are all super operators. So the, the definition of this object is through the Dyson expansion. So it's identity plus the integral and the chronological ordering makes sure that the times are in proper order. Okay. This is just, just a definition of, of the object above. Okay. Now, this is the very brief overview now of master equations, dynamical maps, uh, state, and transformation. Now, the most famous theorem of open quantum system theory, like if you have to know one theorem of open quantum system theory, you have to know this one. Okay, this is the basics. It's the most famous thing of open quantum system theory is the so-called Gorini, Kosakowski, Sudarshan, Limblad theorem. Okay. For many, many years, when I was young, we called, I come from quantum optics. We called this the Limblad theorem. And I remember once, as a young PhD student, like my, I think it was my first year of PhD student, I was presenting my result in Kyoto. I will never forget this. It was about quantum brain and motion. Never mind. Uh, oh, no, no Markovian. And I was presenting, I was introducing this Limblad theorem at that point. And at some point, like disaster happened. I mean, it was like a complete attack. You know, sometimes, I don't know if it has ever happened to you, I had complete attacked by one of these three people, the, the one with the S, who was in the audience, and he absolutely hated the fact that, you know, he was one of the, because you see, there were two papers that, you know, came out more or less at the same time. One by Gorini, Kostakowski, and Sudashan, and the other one by Linda, separately. I mean, okay, they had in, been interacting. There are nice stories about all, all these things, because there has been recently anniversaries of this theory. And Sudashan is, was a little bit of a person, uh, you know, that was very careful about uh, recognition of his own things. And he killed me, basically, okay? But not just about that. He started to criticize everything. Luckily, someone should, uh, had to calm him down. I remember it so well. It was like a little bit of a traumatizing experience. But, you know, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> so it's okay. It was good to do it, uh, to, that it happened at the very beginning, because then I was fine. Okay, so now, uh, uh, this <laughs> also known as the Limblad theorem. I mean, in my, now it's, it's not, uh, not, now everybody call it GKSA, uh, sometimes GKLS, never mind. Uh, but but it it's depends if you want <laughs> to use alphabetical order, I guess. But anyway, the thing is, um, this, this, is uh, this was the basics uh, of, of everything. Especially in, uh, in quantum optics, uh, a lot of people started to use forms of master equation, like the one of uh, 
of the spontaneous emission that in a way, sort of in a phenomenological way, they didn't, there were some, of course there were uh, microscopic derivation and everything, but the point is that um, it, was, it was recognized to be something that worked. Uh, experimentally started to have the first amazing experiments on quantum optics and, and they were very well, you know, the, the results were uh, very well described by master equations of this form and so they, they became very popular and, and, uh, and Limblad himself once I, I, I talked with him, it's interesting because Limblad was from a completely different, uh, he's a mathematical uh, physicist, I would say a mathematician, working in, in, uh, in um, um, a KTH, in, in, in am I saying right? In, in, in Sweden it's KTH, right? In Sweden, uh, no, yeah, it's right, am, am I saying it right? Yeah, somehow, yeah, KTH, in, in, in Stockholm. Uh, and, um, and Okay, I have to say another anecdote. The, only, the, the last one, and I promise, then we go back to the, to the physics. That, that is this, uh, again, th this, this is a positive one, okay? The, the previous one was a negative, and this one is positive. The positive one is that um, I was, again, uh, during my PhD, but after the, this uh, Sudarshan <laughs> bad experience, I went to, I was invited by uh, Professor Stig Stenholm to KTH, and I gave a talk in which I was talking about open quantum systems, and I didn't know it, but there was Limblad in the audience. Uh, and uh, he, um, he, after uh, Stig uh, told me, ah, you, let's go and talk with Limblad. I, I was never able, the Stig Steno, another important professor, he said, I was never able to talk with, with Stig. Uh, let's go and, and, and try to talk together because uh, he's here. And Limblad told me, I know your papers. This was really very nice. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was really like super nice because, well, he had read some of my papers. I was super happy. Okay, uh, so uh, end of the gossiping part. So this was a positive thing. But yes, Limblad was um, a, a theory. Uh, Limblad didn't understand why. This is another thing he told me. He didn't understand why in the physics community, somehow everyone was using this form of master equation. I mean, they were using it like naturally, but he didn't understand why. Why, why is it that uh, it seems to be the only form that physicists are using? Why is it? Uh, and, and he uh, started to look at the mathematical properties and so on, and he derived uh, together at the same time of uh, Gorini, Gostelos, and Sudoshan, this famous theorem that is a characterization uh, of the master equations for dynamical maps which have a semi-group property and that are completely positive, okay? So it really says, if, you, if the dynamical map has a is a semi-group, and I will uh, in show it in a, in a second what this means, and if you want that it is uh, physical, so completely positive and trust preserving, there is no other way, the form of the master equation has to be this one. It's not, <laughs> it's not here. It would have been nice, but it's, uh, soon <laughs> it will arrive. So, so it's a characterization of the, uh, of the form of the master equation. I will show it in a moment. You, you actually, you know it because I'm sure Massimo uh, presented, Professor Palma presented. So, but it was, it's nice because it guarantees that every time you have a, a master equation in that form, the solution is physical. This is great, okay? Because it means you, you can solve it and, and, it's, uh, and it, it will always be the master equation, the, the, the state, the dynamical map, they will be always completely positive. So it was a very nice um, uh, discovery. And, uh, um, and, and this, I would say, is still uh, uh, the main result. So, so what do I uh, want to do here? So I, I, with respect to what I, uh, what I showed here, let's make a, a little step back. Let's assume now that this object here, this super operator, is not explicitly time dependent. So there is no time dependency now. Here I had some time dependency, now I, I don't have it. So I just call it L. And then the, uh, the form of the solution is simplified. It's just the E to minus LT. So I don't need to do this integral, right? So I'm, it's, I'm considering a little bit of a simpler form of dynamical maps. Uh, and the, uh, this is what I was saying before. The, the, this theorem characterizes this, this, this form of master equation and it has um, this, this uh, specific uh, structure. So it says that uh, the, the um, L is the sum of two parts. The first one is the minus I, the commutator between the Hamiltonian of the system uh, and the state. And then you have this other uh, other second part, which describes actually uh, the, um, the decay, the interaction with the environment. So the interaction of the environment mostly come from these terms. There is also, I mean, sometimes it also, no, actually sometimes, to be ex rigorous, there is also a term like a lamb shift which enters into the Hamiltonian. But the, let's say, exchange of uh, 
let's say, this part is, is specifically coming from the interaction of the environment. And these objects here are decay rates, and they are positive. They have to be positive, in, at least in the Limblad um, theorem, mm, this is uh, the requirement in the structure. And these objects here are the jump operators. For example, if you have uh, one two-level atom interacting with an electromagnetic field when you have a spontaneous emission, these jump operators are jump down and jump up. So it describes emission of a photon from the atom to the electromagnetic field and an absorption of it. In this case, there are only two, two and there are two decay channels. There are a, a lot of um, uh, other <coughs> examples, okay? This is very nice. You, you solve it, you have no problems. You, in the sense that it's always physical, the solution. You see, I mean, it's not, it's not said, because you can have master equations that do not have this structure that you can always solve, but you, you cannot guarantee that the state is physical. Then you have to impose or you have to check complete positivity through, for example, this choice theorem, you do this, this. But okay, anyway, this is, this is very nice. Now, the second, or was it the third now? Actually, this is the third take home message, is that this is the one thing you have to know about open quantum system theory, the structure of the master equation, the Gorini, Kostakowski, Sudash, and Lindbergh theorem. Another thing is that if you read the paper of Lindblad, and if you like open quantum system theory, I encourage you to do it. Read the paper of Lindblad, and you will not understand anything. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you also. It's absolutely, completely difficult to... Uh, once, uh, when I was in Turku, before I still in I Turku, I, I lived before in Turku, there were a group of mathematical physicists, a serious mathematical physicists, uh, um, Pekkala, really people who are doing mathematical physics, and Lindblad was a um, mathematician, really. And they say that some point, Sabrina, you like open quantum system, why don't we do a seminar to explain Lindblad, uh, Lindblad theorem uh, following Lindblad paper? And I said, okay, let's organize it. And they were, uh, you know, they said, okay, we organize it. The seminar lasted two days. I mean, two days. <laughs> it was a nightmare. Well, not two days in the sense of two hours. Like from the morning till the evening, two days. And these people talking about, it's very, very uh, sophisticated. It's not simple, okay? It's very, there are a lot of things to say, and I will not tell them. I'm just telling you that this is an amazing thing. And it describes the structures of all the, I didn't use yet the, the term Markovian, um, but this structure indeed uh, is also what people refer to. Uh, initially it was by definition as Markovian master equations. Okay, now. And again, these are examples, uh, lossy, um, the, the master equation of uh, lossy quantum harmonic oscillator. Some of you, for sure, if you have followed uh, op mm, quantum optics courses and so on, you have, uh, you have um, done them. And these are just some examples of simple master equations that you can try to solve. Uh, they are really simple to solve, and you can play the cushions, you can, you can check, uh, you know, they describe different types of noise, okay? I, I will just go uh, quickly. Now, at this point, I, I wanted to tell you something about the microscopic approach, which, however, I will not. Because I want to, it's already 10. It's 10, I mean, I don't want to stop here, but if I have to choose, I would choose uh, about uh, skipping this and telling you about Markovianity and non-Markovianity. So that's my, uh, my choice. Microscopic approach simply means that you can actually write a Hamiltonian for the system plus environment plus interaction, okay? And then from the dynamics of the total system, which is given by von neumann liouville equation that is written there, you can do a number of approximations, step by step, you know, until you reach a master equation in the GKSL form. So this means you, you really, that is, this, you start from here, okay, this rho sp now is the, what I call the rho t before, <laughs> so it's the density, uh, the, the state of the total system. And this is just von Neumann, uh, the von Neumann equation, so it's the same as, uh, it, it's, it's closed, the total system is always closed. But I'm saying you start from this, you do a number of approximations, and you arrive to the Markovian master equation. And these approximations have, 
I, I will just skip. The, the main one is this weak coupling or Born approximation, which means that you, the, one of the main things you assume is that there are no, so that the interaction between system and environment is very weak, okay? So you, it's, it's like a perturbation theory in the interaction. Every time you have strong coupling between system and environment, you need to go beyond uh, Markovian mass segregation. And another thing that you assume is that the correlation time, so you, you, when you, of course, when you make approximations on something which is dynamics, obviously, you need to, th these approximations are defined in terms of time scales, right? So th there are some characteristic time scales. And making approximations means to decide which one is the dominant time scale. Mm -hmm. So in general, what you do is that you have a time scale which characterizes the internal dynamic of the system, a time scale that characterizes the decay, the relaxation, if you want, of the system in presence of the environment, uh, and another time scale that I don't remember. <laughs> okay. No, the, ma the main ones are these, okay. The correlation time uh, between, uh, no, of course, and the, the most important one is the correlation time between the system and environment. So there are some correlations that get established between system and environment. So you have the internal dynamics, correlation times between system and environment, and decay time, characteristic decay time uh, of the system into the environment. And basically, what the, uh, when you do this Born-Markov approximation and then the Markovian approximation, you are uh, assuming that the correlation time between the system and the environment decay very fast, and therefore you, you basically coarse grain the, the, the dynamics and you average them out, okay? So it's basically, uh, the, the in the microscopic derivation, you neglect correlations that are established between system and environment. And in a way, that Markovian master equation is such that you always, you always assume that system and environment are basically uncorrelated, keep staying uncorrelated as the dynamics evolves. But I will not go to the Markovian derivation. Now, uh, do I have, because I started late, do I have 10 more minutes uh, or, uh, um, or, because there is a coffee break, no? The coffee break should have been now. Ah. Ah, okay, because we started, so, l ah, that's great, fantastic. I still will skip the microscopic <laughs> derivation anyway. Uh, this doesn't change, but l let me, exp tell me everything. So now so I continue until half past 10, then af from half past 10 to 11 there is the coffee break, exactly. and, the and then we from 11 until half uh, past, past one, half past 11, half past 12. Yes. So. No, it's impossible. I mean, I think uh, there is another. Okay. Okay. So then I will have another. T I, I will uh, then I will have time uh, between eleven and so I will have one and a half hours after. The second part. So in total, I have three hours. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Sorry, this is great. I mean, like, let's, I can say a lot of stories then. Okay, excellent. But still, I will not give you the microscopic uh, uh, approach because I think, uh, I mean, it's, it's a bit boring. And actually, to be honest, it's really great to do it, but it's nice to do all the steps of the derivation yourself. Do it, if you are interested, do it. It's, it's really, 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 really uh, very useful because the only way in which you understand the, the, um, the different approximations uh, in the time scale and so on, is by doing the derivation yourself. So here I, I, I could say something, but I think it's, it's uh, um, it passes through the integral differential equation, then eventually the Redfield equation, then eventually you obtain a master equation, which is the Markovian one. I, I just don't want to go to the details. But, but the most important thing is that you look at the order of the time scales, correlations decay quickly, you have a very, uh, very weak interaction between system and environment, eventually, from this total system plus environment description, you arrive to a master equation which has this form. Now, what am I saying here? I'm saying I start from microscopic description of system and environment plus interaction, I do approximation and I obtain this. This means that this form of master equation with respect to the, the a microscopic derivation is an approximation, okay? 
So if you start uh, from a system plus environment, uh, a plus interaction description, the only way of, of going to, to that form of master equation is through a series of approximations. It's not an exact description, okay? So you cannot have an exact form of the master equation that is derived from system plus environment plus interaction closed system, which is of Markov form. In general, it will not be. Everyone is happy with this? Yes. Okay. Is there anyone who is not happy with this? No. So we may. Ah, you. Say. Francesco. Sorry? You always have initial quadratic behavior. It cannot be. You have to have Zeno effect. It's by definition. You always will have that. Okay, but you don't have an infinitely fat bending of the environment. So. I mean, it is not physical to have it. I mean, it doesn't exist. Infinitely flat is not physics. Okay, we can argue. But I would say that in general, I mean, yes, you, in general, the behavior of the decay and so on, uh, at least for, uh, for uh, electromagnetic modes, okay, then you will have a decay which starts quadratically. But okay, this is between, between us, of course. Yeah. Look, if the bending, if it's absolutely mathematically infinite, it's true. But mathematical infinity in the that does not exist. So we agree. Okay. There can be mathematically situations in which I, I, I think I agree. Physically, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. Okay, now, let's go beyond Markovianity. Now, let's assume, for now, phenomenologically, that these decay rates here are actually not just positive constants but they are positive, but time-dependent. Okay, so we are, we are somehow enlarging uh, the class of master equations that we are considering. Hmm? Now, the question is, uh, in this case, uh, can we say that this is Markovian? Well, one can easily actually extend uh, the, not easily, easily for Lim, but maybe, but okay, it is possible to, no, actually it is not so difficult, but it is possible to, to see that the same derivation of the gorini kostakowski the same assumption that were stand in the gorini kostakowski sudash and Lim, that theorem, are uh, also uh, valid in this case, and therefore, in general, we consider this generalization uh, still the case of Markovian dynamics. So we say that still, when the time-dependent coefficients are um, positive, even if they are not constant, the dynamics is still Markovian. Okay. The, and in general, the Gorinikos, Sudash, and uh, the GK, uh, okay, you know it, what I'm talking about, holds, really. Um, the dynamical map, however, has a little bit of a different structure, because while in the case in which L is not time-dependent, I have the semi-group property that trivially holds, okay? In the case in which uh, L is time-dependent, uh, I have another property uh, that replaces somehow semi-group here, and this is the fact that the dynamical map at time t can be seen as the composition of a two-family map, lambda ts, and the dynamical map at time s. Here s is smaller than t, okay? So yes. Yes, yes. I mean, it is valid also for gamma dependent on time. So in this case, it is still, it can be generalized. Yes, it can be generalized to the case in which this is, uh, so it is the most general with gamma uh, time dependent and positive. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. And however, this now, the, 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 this property, instead of having this semi-group property, we, we cannot say that it's a characterization for semi-group, but it is a characterization where the dynamical map has this property called divisibility, which means that we can write the dynamical map at any time t uh, as uh, the dynamical map until time s before t, uh, and uh, apply to this propagator, which is a two-parameter uh, two family map, that is completely positive, where complete positivity I, I defined before, okay? 
So and, the, and with these uh, definitions, I can have the I have the GKSL uh, theorem and so on and so forth. So this is now the structure of dynamical maps with master equation, which are which have the Lindbad structure, but time dependent positive coefficients. Okay. Now, however, there exist cases, and we will show one, one example of it, which are physical, physical examples of master equations which have this form, but with time-dependent coefficients that can take temporarily negative values. Now, these forms of master equation exist they are physical, they are encountered. We will show one example here. So is this a problem with respect to what we said before? I mean, we were talking about the characterization uh, because of DJ, GKSL and so on and so forth. I mean, how come this is, uh, uh, this is possible and the, and the solution is still physical? In some cases, not always, huh? there are conditions to be imposed, but the solution is still physical. Why? Are we, wh why is it? Just because actually that theorem does not hold anymore. So you can still have valid physical dynamics that are solutions of this type of master equations, but you will not have this, these properties. So this map will not be like a semi-group or, or, or um, having these this other properties. So we will describe this more in general, but it's important to notice that when I talked about the characterization, what, I'm s uh, what I want to say is that here the characterization does not um, imply that these forms of master equation may not exist and may not be physical. It implies that if I have the complete positivity, if, if, I, if, my, if I know that my map is completely positive or a semi-group, then for sure I, I have to have the Lindblad uh, uh, structure, okay? But in general, I can also not have Lindblad structure and have a physical dynamics, okay? And we will see one example of this. In general, this is what I will call Markovianity. However, I will say, uh, in so I will call Markovianity the cases uh, in which uh, this, uh, this time-dependent coefficient uh, turns out to be at some times negative. Not always, but at some times can be negative. Now, now this is what, what we define as Markovian and Markovian is a large, there is a large uh, discussion about this and the uh, whole community has proposed uh, uh, a lot of different uh, definitions, uh, or different ways of uh, understanding non-Markovianity. And uh, here, in the, at least in this room, there are a lot of people who have even de proposed definitions of non-Markovianity that are different. Me, Francesco, Tony, Steve, uh, everyone. Everyone has proposed, uh, uh, contributed to un the understanding of what, what, what it is that goes beyond uh, this, this, um, you know, this the standard Markovian form. Th why? Because it turns out that in many physical relevant uh, experimental scenarios, the Markovian description is not sufficient. It, it's good for quantum optics, for, uh, for example, KVD, QED, and so on, but there are many cases in which you have to go beyond the description of Markovian noise. And, and then this gave rise lately to a number of, of uh, um, studies. Okay. So when, when the, just as a, question of definition of, of, of uh, or if you want, uh, uh, names. Uh, when this intermediate map, this propagator here, is not completely positive, then we say that the dynamical map lambda t is non-divisible, lacks this divisibility property. So as before it was divisible, now it will be non-divisible. Okay? Questions? Generally, it is an interval, yes, but there should exist at least, oh my God. We have um, this. Ah, nice, yes. Come on. I don't know if every. Yes, yes, go ahead. Oh my God, it's very dangerous, however, but yeah. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Mm. 
I have to repeat the question. I mean, of course, in general, you will see that there are um, finite intervals for which this doesn't happen, generally. Okay, now, examples that I encourage you to play with. This is a case uh, of, uh, these are Pauli channels, only that this, this sigma k are sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 are the Pauli matrices. Uh, and you can have uh, here these gamma coefficients that can be time dependent, okay? And it turn you can solve this, and it turns out that this dynamics is legitimate or, physic uh, or, or um, physical whenever the integrals of these decay rates are positive. Now that I think about it, is it if and only if? I don't remember anymore, Francesco, you, you, I think so. I think so. But okay, for sure it is a sufficient, I think it's necessary and sufficient condition. But anyway, it's just to say in this case, this, this uh, little uh, time dependent coefficients here, they can be temporarily negative, but their integral has to be positive. And this ensures that the, um, that the, that the dynamics is, uh, is, is physical. Okay. Now, why do you have to ensure that the dynamics is physical? Hmm? Because the, it, it has to be physical because we want that the state is a positive operator at all times, but we don't have this guarantee anymore from the master equation now. Because if the gorini kostakovsky sudash and Limgard theorem were satisfied, then I would know that if I solve it, it is automatically completely positive, right? So I wouldn't have any problem. But now, this, this type of master equations, they don't satisfy that theorem, so there may be solutions which are unphysical. And therefore, you, you have somehow to give extra conditions that guarantee the physicality of the solutions. Just as an example, formally, formally, you can solve, uh, you can have a, a solution, this thing is, the, sorry, <laughs> soon my country. So um, the, 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 you can have a formal solution of this master equation also when these conditions are not satisfied. You can derive it, right? It's there, it's a mathematical solution, however. The physical solution requires to impose this, uh, uh, this condition. And, and generally, I mean, this, this is a qubit. So, uh, actually, to impose complete positivity for a qubit is still manageable, right? Because you, you, I showed the Choi uh, uh, theorem, and you, you can do it, because in the, in the worst case, you have a two-qubit two uh, space, and you impose the condition. As a, so you can derive them, actually, the complete positivity condition. But in general, if I have 100 qubits, it's a bit difficult <laughs> post complete positivity. So this is just to say that it would be nice to know what is the most general form of a master equation which preserves complete positivity beyond the lean blood. But we don't know it. It's an open problem. It has not been solved. Okay? Okay, very nice. Uh, by the way, this is the solution in case you wanted to see it. Uh, it's here. Um, well. If you, if you have solved this, uh, this equation, like the dynamics of the Pauli uh, channel um, in, uh, for, for the Markovian case, you will see that, uh, well, if you, if, you if you make this not time dependent, you obtain the, well, okay, it's obvious, right? So whenever you, but, but this is the form. The analytical form is this one. Uh, here is uh, the, the dynamical map is written uh, in terms of the Krauss operators and there are these time dependent coefficients here. Okay. Incidentally, because we talked about uh, unitality as one of the initial properties, this is a unital map, and uh, well, no, you can see that these are, can be written as random unitaries. In case you have been discussing about random unitaries in the, uh, for the quantum computer and near-term devices, it's just a connection of this type of noise. Okay. Okay. Now, break. Think of a question. 
that you may have. And then, but you will not, some of you will be able to do this, some of you will not be able to do this. I mean, everybody is able to do this question, obviously. I, I, I mean, maybe, but actually not, because maybe you don't have any question and you, you, you know, I explained well or you, you were thinking something else, which is okay, because obviously it's part of, you know, the school. But uh, the first time I, I uh, did it was, was fun and I want to do it again. So do you see this? You don't see it very well. This is a little uh, airplane uh, uh, made of paper, okay? Now, for those of you who have pen and paper, you will have a few minutes to write the question on the paper and then throw it to me, okay? This is how it works. But only those of you, who of you have paper, pen and paper? Yes, you have. I will give you some time, okay? A few, few, little bit of time. Just create your own paper airplane with your question, and then we do a three to one, and you send it to me. Send it here. Into, send it means physically. You have to do this operation, okay? Okay, go ahead. You have two minutes. And meanwhile, I... I Meanwhile, I check my emails. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good thing, you know. Thanks, but look, this is everything is so perfect here. Guys, thank you. I'm impressed. And now I feel a different person. <laughs> I, made the, I made the mistake. I no, but I mean, I, I, I'm, I can tell you officially that I've never been this so well organized. You guys are amazing. I it was everything perfect. I'm sure. No, come on, these are small things. I mean, it's nice. It, it gives me the opportunity to joke, you know, interact. Thanks. Unbelievable. <laughs> Wow. Oh, I'm really going to kiss my ass, right? No, I'm impressed. <laughs> Very impressed. Thanks. Okay, so how is it going there with the the writing? You want to have a few more minutes? Oh, wow, I saw a very nice one. Sorry, I, I saw it. It's very nice. Very well done. I mean, people have different techniques and styles I discovered <laughs> recently. Yeah. Okay, everyone, who is not ready? Who wants to have more time? Okay, one person, is, uh, Francesco is there, huh? Now, the people who are in the back, of course they have to use more, you know, strength, because otherwise the, it, it will not arrive. The people who are in front, they are advantaged, obviously. Uh, there are some very small also, there are different sizes. Okay, now, what I will do is that I will do four, three, no, not five, four. Now, I, first I'm saying it, and then, I, no, wait. I'm first saying what I will be doing, and I will be doing this, four, three, two, one, go, okay? So, and meanwhile you prepare, and then, uh, it's okay, if you don't have the paper plane, I will not hate you, it's fine, but if you have it, just, uh, just uh, use it, okay? Ready, everyone ready? Okay. Come, come, go, go, so quick, quick, okay. Fantastic, okay. Four, three, two, one, go! <laughs> okay, okay. Wow, I'm impressed, okay. This one did not fly much, okay. I have to say, this, the aerodynamics of this one wasn't good. Now we have people who are doing second and third round. I'm coming to take it. Fantastic. 
There is one who was, okay, this is obviously too heavy. <laughs> it's a very long, very big question. And one, the winner, however, is here. I mean, I don't know who did this piece of uh, aerodynamic. <laughs> it's like, this is amazing. I mean, look at this. It, it, it would have gone also in the other room if the door was open, but no. Okay, now, I will uh, answer to, I uh, will not answer, I will just read this one and this one. The others for the discussion. Ah, oh, but there is a... You, you, you don't have a question, but it's not, you have a nice airplane. It, uh, throw it, throw it, throw it. Okay, it's nice. On yes, yes, on me, on me, on me. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, this is, uh, it's without question, but it's a nice airplane. Okay, now, here we have one question that is, uh, ah, let's see. Would not Nakajima's Vanzig equation be the most general form of open quantum dynamics? What additional, const additional constraints are we requiring? Very nice. Nakajima's Zwanzig master equation is very cool. And uh, there is a very nice description of it in the book. Uh, and it's true. Uh, it is a very, very powerful, uh, because Nakajima Svancic takes into account also, it goes beyond, you know, the, the, the weak coupling. He has, uh, can have many orders and so on. However, it is a very formal master equation. Now, take Nakajima Svancic master equation and try to use it in, in, a, in a very um, concrete example. And it is very difficult to, to do something which is, uh, uh, which has, um, you know, which has a, a um, that, that you can really use uh, at all orders. So Nakajima Svancic is a formal uh, way of writing a master equation. Uh, however, the characterization in terms of a linear master equation with time-dependent coefficients, which is given uh, by the, um, the um, Gorini-Kosakowski, Sudashin and Limblad, is the form of master equation for semi-group dynamics uh, that, that um, guarantees complete positivity. So I would say that I will not enter into the, into the description of the Nagajima Zvancic master equation, but, but it, is, um, it is a formal description, really, it's a formal solution. I don't know how to say more of this, but what would you say, Francesco? Tony? Steve? Yes. Yes. But very nice airplane, however. Also, the question is very good, yes. Yeah. Well, look, the point is that in general, then when you solve it, how do you, I mean, I don't know how to uh, express this. I mean, as a matter of fact, when you want to use it, when you want to solve and use the Nakajima Zvancic master equation, in, you, you need to make some approximations in general, because otherwise you just have, yeah, of course, you can also say that the formally I can have the, um, the solution which is given uh, by, um, you take the von Neumann uh, equation, you so formally solve it, and you trace over the, uh, over the environmental degrees of freedom. This is also, um, you know, a way of saying I, I do have the complete dynamics, but it is not, uh, in, in a way what you need uh, is, a, is a master equation which has, uh, what you want to have is something which has this form, because it has, uh, let me look at this. So, you see, it has here, it's in terms of, a, of an opera, explicitly you have the, you have the master equation which depends, so, so derivative of the master equation here and at time t, and master equation at time t here, okay? So you don't have integrals which contain uh, several, uh, um, several, um, several uh, coefficients, several uh, generators, several super operators, but also several uh, rho s at times which are before t. Okay, so it's, it's sort of local in time. Okay, so, so you, you have, on the one hand, you have the derivative, like what you would have in an equation of motion, like uh, Schrodinger. On the, on the one hand, you have uh, the, the derivative of the state, and on the other hand, you have the state at time t. 
So it's, it's like explicitly describing uh, the dynamics of, this, of the system, so how the future evolution of the system depends on the system at time t. Okay? In this sense, it's, it's a structure that is, uh, in a way, I would say more, more rigorously called as a master equation, while the other one would be a generalized master equation in which the, the solution is given in terms of a convolution for which it is difficult also to impose conditions. And of course, you can always say, if the state, so if I don't do any approximation, of course, you can always say, if I'm able to solve this complicated equation, and I have done no approximation, of course, the, 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 um, the solution should be physical. This is always the case. Because if I don't do any approximation and I start from system and environment, which are uh, the total system is closed and I have a unitary dynamics, then in any case, if I'm able to solve without approximation, I know that the state should be physical, obviously. There is no way that it cannot be. But it is really formal and is like involving several integrals uh, and several kernels with several uh, um, iterations of the state at previous times. So I, I would, wouldn't call it, uh, let's say, properly a master equation in this sense. But it's a good point. Okay, now I think that it is really half past, I guess, is it? And therefore, it is time for uh, the gr break. Um, and then we will switch gears and go to something which is uh, a, a little bit different and much more related to near-term devices, okay? So near-term uh, quantum computers and algorithms. So in the second part, after the break, I will talk about, it would be nice, right? to run these algorithms on near-term devices like using Qiskit, and you have been doing, and it's nice, you can do them, you can use Qiskit, the ticket, and all, the, all these things, it's, it's really a, a very powerful tool. However, the problem is that, of course, if you want to do this for complex problems, uh, you can't do it, because there is noise, right? Noise is the main, noise in do in coming from the interaction with the environment is the main problem, the main limitation of near-term quantum devices. So in the second part of the talk, we will talk I, I will talk about how it affects and the strategy you know, to improve via some error mitigation and via some, some other um, you know, tricks to improve what you can do in hybrid algorithms on near-term quantum devices. This is something very recent, so I'm going to talk about research-related things. But I thought it would be stimulating. No, you are all... Uh, uh, you know, you want to have, both, I guess, both, both things, both the more research things. And uh, So nice. Uh, thank you, and uh, we will switch gears in the second part. And I will read all these questions. Thank you. <laughs>